Okay, so welcome to the 17th episode of An Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be speaking to Ben Cole. So Ben is a filmmaker and specializes in making documentaries. And among others is One Giant Leap and Time of the Sixth Sun. He was also an actor for 20 years um, and makes positive films. What's it like to be a human? Um, you know, seeing that the ordinary man is the new guru. Uh, he also teaches the mankind principles of the four archetypes. And he also teaches the wheel of soul's return. And he is also a mentor with the band of brothers, um, mentoring uh, young offenders. So welcome, Ben. Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Mm. So, um, what I'd love to hear, so Ben and myself, we met last year um, at uh, MenFest, a uh, men's festival, uh, and we were talking then about boarding school. So both of us went to boarding school, um, and obviously the podcast is based around kind of people's boarding schools experience, and also kind of this idea of transformation as well. So I'd love for you to share a little bit of your own journey, some of your insights, um, and yeah, I'd love to to hear, yes, some of some of your sharings. Great. Well, I suppose I've count myself as a boarding school experienced man in a slightly different way to most, or what the myth of boarding schools are, as in public schools. Uh, I was sent to a boarding school in Fifield in Chipping Norton in, in Essex. Uh, I was 11 years old and one, I think the motivation for sending me there was that I was a twin. I was arguing quite a lot with my twin brother and my mother who was about to study child psychology went to the headmistress and talked about what what whether she should split us up and send us to different schools. And I think that she was anxious about getting into studying child psychology and how much time that was gonna take. And so the headmistress suggested that maybe they send one of us to a boarding school. Uh, my mother tells me that I was sent because I was good with strangers. She would send me to a park and say, ask that man the time. And I would immediately, my twin brother would like push me forward and say, you know, you do it. And I was very happy to just to, to speak to strangers. So I was given a book called Jennings Grows Up, mm -hmm. in which there was fantastic stories of midnight feasts in, <laughs> in dormitories and, uh, you know, romping around the countryside and having great times. And I, this was very attractive to me, um, I was fed up with arguing and, um, you know, I was in a small village in Essex and um, it was all a great adventure. I remember waking up on my seventh birthday wanting to travel around the world and experience as much life as possible and this represented to me an opportunity to do that. So I welcomed it and I remember standing there with my trunk uh, full of the clothes to take uh, my mother saying, look, if you really don't want to go, you don't have to. And of course, I was kind of, hey, I'm going on an adventure. This <laughs> is great. Um, arrived at boarding school and very quickly, I mean, we'd had a, like an hour walk around the school and my mom had sort of turned around to me and said, oh, this looks OK, doesn't it? And the, I was attracted to it because it was a mixed boarding school. So it wasn't just boys, it was girls, too. And I thought, oh, great, there'll be a community of friends. Arrived at the boarding school and uh, there were 30 to a dormitory. And this is 1971. It was a bit Dickensian in the, the, the buildings, uh, some modern blocks, but the dormitories were in this old Dickensian sort of rather dark foreboding building. And, the bo and I had a horsehair mattress that was given to me uh, in these 30 beds in one room and the wardrobes were collected in a kind of wall around the sick former that was the, the sort of in charge of us kids. Um, 
And very, very quickly, uh, it occurred to me that these kids were from very different background to me. Most of them I discovered within the first few weeks had been sent there by social services. That the quite a lot of kids from the army um, and there was a lot of trauma going on. Um, within a few weeks, they'd organized, uh, you know, uh, in quiet moments, they would organize four beds in a square and they would have boxing matches, fighting matches. And it was well known that if you lost your temper, you would lose. So the cooler kids, the tougher kids would punch each other. And this to me, I would never had a fight. I mean, I was fighting with my twin brother, squabbling and, and wrestling. But I, you know, never punched a guy in the face. And there I was, 11 years old, standing in the dormitory with my mouth open, going, oh, my God, these kids are brutal. Uh, the sick formers were obviously very traumatized, um, very aggressive. Uh, one day early on in the first term, I witnessed a sick former pick up a huge tray of food and throw it at one of the dinner ladies serving the food. And I noticed very quickly that nobody did anything about it. That the actually the the, the teachers were quite scared and intimidated by it. Um, and within the first term, we were we we had these bars going down the dormitory, which were brilliant for swinging around like a monkey on. And I was particularly good at this. Mm -hmm. um, and I won the year uh, record for for swinging like a monkey down these bars. Unfortunately, as I was hanging on the bars, going, "How about that? I've just been the record." I had a searing pain to my right buttock and our housemaster had slippered me with a size 12 leather uh, old um, football boot that had leather studs, 16 leather studs on the bottom of it. And you would get a bit of kudos uh, depending on how many bruises the studs gave you. So I got a full 16 bruises little round bruises um, and that I thought well maybe that's kind of made me get on with these the the, the bullies I remember the first where well, we had to um, go for lunch and we had to find us our, our place at the table so there were spare places so we walked around and I immediately found a place and there was a spare place sitting next to me and this ginger haired guy rather sort of plump ginger haired guy was was crying because he couldn't find a space so I offered him the space next to me and said you know come come, come sit here he turned into the, the my year's bully mm -hmm. um, and obviously quite traumatized himself quite insecure uh, there was a little kid called Mark who I had a bit of a tussle in the corridor and he was getting a bit heavy with me. So I got my ha hand around his neck and held him up against the board saying, look, let's calm down. You know, I, I don't want to fight with you. And he punched me with his fist around my face. And that was the first time I'd ever been punched. You know, I'm 11 and, and I cried. I, I cried a lot. And that seemed to trigger the rest of the year to believe that I was a bit of a weakling, mm -hmm. that I, I cried with one punch where they were having, you know, punching matches in the dormitory. And um, from that moment on, I was, um, I was kind of picked on. And I think, I think the bullying started because as um, in most public schools, the working class kid would be bullied. I was middle class, well spoken. My mother's an elocution teacher, and I was um, I was marked out as a privileged kid. I was the only kid in my year whose parents were together, and uh, all the girls liked me. The weird thing is, I was the year's weed, and yet I I had all the girlfriends. So I would go and snog my girlfriend in the French classroom at breaks. But things got worse when in the second year, um, I was marked out as a well-behaved kid. 
and I was put in a smaller dormitory next to the television room with about five other kids. And this was marked by the, that set us apart, that divided and ruled the whole year. And we were the privileged kids. We were allowed to watch TV a bit longer and we were in our own small dormitory. And so the rest of the year used to come down and do raids on our dormitory. And things like apple pie your bed, which is kind of quite common, but it, it, it extended into kids coming down and holding up the bed, lifting your bed up to about four, four or five feet and then dropping it while you're asleep. So you'd sort of wake up in this and then they would all bundle in on you. I remember one evening when the bullying really, really badly started was that we had, we'd have a cup of cocoa and a biscuit before we went to bed in the, in the, in the canteen, in the uh, dining room. And we would ha we hang around and I was always trying to kind of show these kids that I was not a nice guy. I was not well behaved. I wasn't the, you know, that I would join in a bit, you know, and I wanted to be their friends. So everybody nicked an extra biscuit when the teacher went in to get the milk, extra milk. And I nicked a biscuit. And of course, guess who got caught? I got caught and the teacher came back and made everyone put all their biscuits back in the tin. Um, and no, everybody went off without any biscuits. And I thought, oh God, I'm in trouble here. And when I got back into the boot locker room, uh, the lights went out as soon as I walked in and I got about 25 kids bundling in, kicking and beating me. Um, and then they ran out of the room, switched the lights on and came back in and went, what's happened what what, what 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 who did this to you and i you know i turned around and said you did this to me i know who's doing it and after that it became a bit of a game um at lunchtime i would be chased around the school uh and if they caught me i'd be beaten up um and this went on and on for weeks you know at the end of break times they would say oh that was great you know can we do that again tomorrow and i go no i don't want to do it again tomorrow um and then something very strange happened the more traumatized kids so there was one guy next to me in the bed who was called leslie and he had eczema and asthma and every, anywhere there was a crease in his skin would get very itchy and he would scratch all night long and he couldn't sleep. And I, oh, I was bored one, one morning and I was reading my Gideon Bible, which they put next to your bed. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, would I pray for him? And I said, yeah, sure. I was a bit spirit. I was very spiritual. I didn't really know who God or the Bible was. And I lay back on my bed and um, I had a bit of a, transcendental experience I sort of sat up in my imagination looked over at him and saw all these black snakes wrapping around his body so I started to sort of reach over and pull him off and he freaked out and said stop whatever you're doing it feels weird um, and all actually what I was doing was lying on my bed meditating mm -hmm. praying and after that, um, he told all the class, and I was called Jesus. Um, on the football field, it was like, go on, Jesus, you know. Um, but we used to play these games, which was old English football, which is you've got a rugby ball in the middle of the field, and there's four teams, and you have to get the rugby ball and put it back to your square. Mm -hmm. And the only rule is you can't kill. So the tough kids would bundle in on the weak kids and it was a good excuse for a big big fight really um and i was terrified of this game um and so i i this went on for a few terms and eventually leslie uh invited me out um to the village to go to the sweet shop and he told me his story he told me about his step, his mother dying, and his father married. You know, his, his father died, and his mother married another man, who was very aggressive and very angry. And then his mum died, and his stepfather had another child, and his and this child was very naughty and would set fire to the curtains, 
uh, torture the cat, and do things like that. And he was always blamed for it. So his, his stepfather would take his belt off and whip him with the buckle end, uh, uh, saying, you know, you're a naughty boy. And he said, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, and blame his brother. And then, of course, after about 20 swipes, he, he thought, well, I'm not, it's just never going to stop. So he would admit to it, and then he'd get another 20 swipes for lying. And we get back, we got back to the school, and um, he, he punched me in the face and said, I'm so sorry, I can't be your friend. I can't be seen to be your friend. And um, I, I then uh, went back to the canteen. The next morning we had a cross country run. It was ice and snow outside. So we did about a five mile run. And there was Leslie, Mark, and this ginger haired guy on the bridge and they weren't going to let me cross and they said we want you to hang off the bridge it must have been only about 20 feet over the water with about three foot of water. it was just a, a ditch really um and i said no you'll stamp on my fingers and i, I don't want to get wet and they said you're going to do it so i hung off the bridge they stamped on my fingers and i fell into the ice and went through the ice and luckily it wasn't that deep so I trudged the side and went back to the school and after that at lunchtime um, I sat at the table um, and you have to understand it's a bit like Tom Brown's school days you know the two prefects on the table would uh, steal your food if you hadn't eaten it before they had and they'd had six years of practice of eating food really quickly um, and if you complained, they get the salad cream bottle, take the top off it and go, plow, and all the salad cream would come all over you, all over your uniform. And all the masters would do would just send you to get cleaned up. And this day, um, I, my food was stolen and I knew that I couldn't complain. And I started crying. I'm about 12 years old. I couldn't stop. And the, the prefect on my table sent me to see the master. And I, I went up to the master. He said, what's wrong, boy? And I said, well, I just can't stop crying. So he sent me down to, to sick bay. And they gave me some extraordinary drugs that were obviously antidepressants. And I slept for a day. And I, um, uh, Donny Osman brought out a single crazy horses. Wow. And I, w I used to run up and down the sick bay doing air guitar and sliding my socks. And I was sent back to school. And there was a pandemic at that stage uh, in the school. And so everybody was sucking victory V's and going down to sick bay and getting a temperature of 104 which what what a victory v does to your mouth and faking that they got the flu so we all ended up in the dormitory living on powdered chicken soup for a few days that soon got us back into school so this was all very nerve-wracking for me and i one by one the students realized that i was a good listener and they would walk me out we'd go for a walk and I would keep watch while they were smoking cigarettes in the ditches and they would tell me their life stories. And then sure enough, I'd get back to school and they would be mean to me. And I, I really get it now that they really confessed some of their deep traumas to me and they didn't want me spreading it around the rest of the school. And I think so therefore they like to keep the intimidation going on me. With well, the end of the second year, um, I there was one phone in the school where you could phone your parents out of about four or 500 students. I could draw you this phone booth. <laughs> I used to go down to the tuck shop, buy a Mars bar, go to the uh, drying room and eat the Mars bar as quickly as I could. Uh, to try and lift myself out of this sort of depressed trauma. Um, and I was on the phone one day in the phone booth with my mouth full of Mars bar uh, to my mom. And she said, it's all right. You don't have to be there anymore. 
whenever I rang her, she would say, I don't want you to run away from problems in your life. So you, I think you should stick it out. You know, I, I, I was great at theater. I, I did theater shows and it kind of concluded. I was just about, I, I just got kind of a rumor that I was gonna leave. And uh, the sick formers came into, the, into our, our prep study and they said, does anyone uh, n uh, know of a band that we can have the, for, the, for the next dance? Now these dances were every Saturday evening uh, all the boys down one side of the room, all the girls down the other side of the room, and no one would dance until the last song. Everybody's standing there cool. Apart from one guy in the school, me. As soon as the music started, I'd be in the middle of the dance floor, dancing <laughs> my little heart out, loving the dance. And, you know, kids would come up to me and punch me and kick me and say, what the fuck are you doing? You, you, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're showing us up because they were too embarrassed to dance. And this had happened and uh, I was on the phone telling my mom and saying, look, I just, you know, I'm so unhappy. And she said, I'm gonna bring you home. So I thought, great, whatever I did to be sent away to this sort of borstal, as it were, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been forgiven. And so I got home uh, and my twin brother was I've never seen him in such a bad state. He was really angry. And he confessed to me that he'd been listening at, his, at the door to my mom on the phone and they were going to get a divorce. Now, when you think about it, I spent two years being bullied because my parents would turn up, both my parents would turn up with nice clothes and they looked, you know, it looked like I had a nice family. And the first evening I get home, my dad sits us down. My mum wasn't even there. And he said, we're getting a divorce and you're going to go and live with this, with your mother and, and her lover. Um, and to me, that just seems like, oh, you know, I just got home. I just, I just got back into safety and suddenly the whole family was, 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 was splitting up. So I think I was a bit of a mess. I mean, only two years. Most people have... You know, they go to boarding school at six and they don't leave till they're 18. I was only there for two years, but I could actually draw everything about that school. I still remember every single detail. I still remember every single day. Um, and I, I, the weird thing is, is that I got back to Essex and there were these discos on Thursday and Saturday nights in the local town. And they were known as very rough. There was the Debden and Loughton and Woodford gangs that you all used to meet at the disco. And if you looked at the wrong girl in the wrong way, you get a smash bottle or smash glass in your face, you know. And I wasn't scared. My twin brother was terrified, but I had developed this hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. I knew when I walked in a room who was dangerous, where the, where the exit was, and I knew how to, my defense was a kind of charm to strangers. I would, I, I knew how to befriend people. I was very good with that. Um, and that gave me skills in acting and, um, you know, I, I, I became an actor, but I think I was very, very unhappy and very um, traumatized in a way in myself. I, I was very nervous and I wasn't very, I think it put me about 10 years behind everyone else at school. I mean, the, the education at this school was dreadful. We had a seven foot five tall French teacher uh, who'd had trapped his balls in his zipper when he was a kid and so hadn't got testosterone developed and had grown and grown and grown and grown since the testosterone that stops your growth and um, and he was a nightmare um, very intimidating very angry he would just pick a kid up and um, uh, really really um, really intimidating and you know uh, every Thursday evening our housemaster would in would get us to line up after our showers and pull back our foreskins and reveal our our, 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 our willies to him 
and he was well known. And this, we, we just thought, well, maybe he's just doing a medical check. But I now, I many years later, I realised that every Sunday afternoon he would have tea for the very camp kids in the school, and that he was gay, and that he was doing awful things to these kids. Um, and you know, I have to say, seven young men. I woke up one night and seven men, young guys from my dormitory had tied their sheets together and were climbing out the window. They broke into the local town. They broke into the pub, got drunk, broke into the chemist, stole loads of girls' makeup and all that. Went, came back to the school, broke into the year above them's dormitory. So that's the 13, 14 year old girls laid all these gifts on their beds and seven girls got pregnant that night. So all 14 kids were expelled. So there was a very weird, very strange, surreal experience of, uh, you know, um, just a lot of kids really ruling the school and having this toxic behavior amongst the boys. The girls were very kind to me. They would walk up to the bullies and kick them in the balls if they were bullying me. But of course that just stirred them up even more. Um, and just, I think, uh, I, I, m my best mates were the girls because I just didn't have, there was no boy who had the courage to, to look after me or to befriend me. I was terrified about going to the loo. Whenever I walked into the toilets, they would, um, they beat me up, they threatened. I mean, they never actually put my head down the toilet and flushed it, but they threatened to do it. Um, and they would do, you know, things that I don't really want to mention here, really, because they're just a bit, a bit gross. Um, and I would just, so I, I would, you know, I would be on my own a lot. And I had some very deep spiritual breakthroughs in my, in my sense of faith. Um, and some very traumatic experiences watching girls fight because boys would walk up and kick each other or punch each other but girls would scratch and pull hair and i mean they were they were brutal and no one seemed to do anything about it um so uh so i spent the rest of my teenage years being quite confident around essex around the gangs and around the school um you know, the first time anyone gave me a dead leg in the playground, I went up and punched him really hard on the on the arm and he burst into tears and no one touched me again. You know, I was like, I'd learnt my lesson, you know. I knew that I had to actually, you know, I started smoking cigarettes around the back of the bicycle sheds with the boys, with the bullies in my year so that I would get in with them. I'd sort of learnt that technique, but I think I gave my power away very quickly. Uh, 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 at, at Firefield Boarding School, we would have these um, lethal weapons, which were called clackers. There were two plastic balls on the end of strings with a pole. And you would whack them uh, to bounce off each other. Well, basically, they're lethal weapons. And so kids would walk around the school with these like this, right near your head. Um, and, and, you know, so that was the kind of the local weapon that people would use. Um, and, you know, ironically, I then, I spent next 20 years um, being an actor. I think I'd, I'd learned to shapeshift. I'd learned to, to portray. I think I wanted to learn how to be a man by playing other men. I played a lot of priests and a lot of um, sensitive characters, uh, Mohican punks, um, opposite Gary Oldman and people like that. But um, all quite troubled, troubled characters. Um, and I suppose it got to about 15 years ago where I was... Um, I was troubled that I, I was very nervous in a room of men. I didn't trust men. 
I always thought that I always had this feeling that a group of men would gang up on me. Well, of course I did. I, you know, that was my earliest trauma. And so I joined a men's group um, in Brighton in a loft. And I forced myself to go and sit in the circle with men. And luckily for me, they had started studying with Mankind Project. And they'd spent two or three years working on the four archetypes. And they, I sat in on the first few meetings and there were these men going, you know, we were planning the first quest. So they were planning, they, they decided that they were all, all okay and they were getting themselves healthy, but they were leaving the meetings and walking around Brighton and, and finding these, seeing these young men on the streets, lost, drunk, delinquent. What were they going to do about it? So they got, we got a mission together to get together with the man from Mankind Project and devise uh, a rite of passage for young men so that they would know that there are men in their community that were safe and that had their backs. And I just thought this was amazing. And I, you know, I was a documentary filmmaker. So I sat there and went, look, I'm a document. I want to document this. And they went, no. Confidentiality is really important here. So, and we don't know who you are, so you better get to know us. And then maybe in a few years time. So um, I, went, I went along and I, um, I was very intimidated meeting these young offenders. I was very scared. I thought, you know, they're all about, they're like 17, 18. So they were like the sick formers at the school. Um, and very tough on probation, GBH, things like that, uh, theft. But what I realized that I, for the first time in my life, I had a group of 30 men around me that were healthy, that I could trust with my vulnerability, that I learned that actually being vulnerable, being hypervigilant, having feelings, um, uh, insecurities were part of being masculine. And that actually sitting in a circle of men uh, speaking up about my vulnerability, about my fears, and having processes like carpet work that Mankind Project people will know well, meant that I could, I could exorcise these bullies from my psyche, that I could actually talk to these bullies. And I remember one exercise where I was bashing hell out of this punch bag with a with a baseball bat uh, really you know killing off these bullies and I had my brothers up there and I had all the men in front of me represented by these men that had bullied me or or treated me a bit you know uh, badly and I got to the young men at the boarding school and I suddenly realized hurt people hurt people and that these young kids were 11 year old 12 year old kids mm -hmm. that had been tortured and beaten up by older men and that this had cursed them and that actually it wasn't their fault and I didn't want to bash them with a baseball bat I didn't I wanted to forgive them I wanted to be kind to them I wanted to hear their stories. I wanted them to be heard as I needed to be heard. And that, that cured me. That made me suddenly realize that I could make a difference. And I started studying with my wife, who's a shamanic workshop runner um, at that time and now runs the Wheel of Souls Return, um, MiddleEarthMedicine.com. And she, I, I ended up standing in a stream with a sword in my hand. And I did a ritual to cut the ties of my victim to these men. And I made a pledge to help young traumatized men to, to feel safe in men's company. And so I've made films on addiction I've made, I'm making a film on the dark night of the soul. I'm making, um, I make 
my own films okay i work on other people's films but something about things like time of the sixth son and, and one giant leap they were all meeting people who you would normally like hobos and and sadhus and uh or down and outs and asking for their wisdom mm -hmm. and i really discovered that if we're wounded that there is something activated in all of us there's a sensitivity there's an an, an initiation so what is initiation initiation is where we go through a traumatic experience where we believe something's going to die we believe we're going to die and in that something dies some polished ego if you like some grandiosity some a sense of arrogance that i'm special dies with it and for me that had happened at boarding school I had realized that I was privileged, middle class, that I, I, I'd had some, some sort of privilege in my life and that there were other people who weren't and that that had been ripped away from me. Um, and I, I'm not saying that I still don't have a fear of being ganged up against, but I'm now 61, you know, and I have some tools that I've learnt and I sit with young men now who have exactly the same trauma that I went through and I can say you know what I've, I've been there I know what you're talking about and I can help you to trust one man in your life uh, and I'm willing to ask what ails you what's your grief and I'm willing to hold that grief and listen and have it heard and share my grief too and and find a way for those these young men to to for once in their life to actually to, to be supported. And we've, you know, at the Band of Brothers, we have an 80% success rate, self-reported 80% success rate of non-reoffending. These young men give up the drugs, they give up the crime, they make friends with their babies, mothers, quite a lot of them have had kids at a young age. They suddenly have a circle of men that they can sit in once a week and they can talk about their failures, their fear, their grief, their anger. And what I've discovered is the on, on the other side of this anger I have for these for these years of trauma, or these two years of trauma, is power. And that I get angry when my power is taken away from me. Or when, no, let me rephrase that, when I give away my power. And it's easier for me to blame others. And to hold on to my power and and to to work through the 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 fear that makes me strategize and, and, and makes me want to predate and be the predator on others to gain revenge, to know that on the other side of that fear is trust, is confidence, and that I, I have a healthy sovereign within me that was there, was there in that little kid that went for walks with these young boys telling me these horrendous stories of how they've been treated by adults and siblings that i had a joy there that i could do that 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 triggered some soul purpose in me to do something about it so i've spent 16 years mentoring these young men i i'm totally devoted to to teaching others how the, how we can start to nurture ourselves and to give ourselves what we missed out on which was a loving family that wanted us around mm -hmm. so now when i when the little boy inside of me says i'm lonely or i'm fear of being abandoned i can go off into a room and i can contact the adult the parent in me and i can look at my story and look at what that has provoked me to do for others and find my soul's purpose in that and go out and sit with a young man and hear his grief and do something about it and in return the mirror in that young man 
is that the little boy, the little 11 year old boy in me that was beaten up and traumatized for my privilege mm. gets healed by me. So that's why I say uh, every single soul is a poem written on the back of God's hand. Mm. That every mm. single traumatized kid has a gift mm. Mm. in that that trauma opened up the doors of perception in that young man a sensitivity to what others are feeling and that if we can turn that round and use that perceptive sensitivity to to hear other people's grief mm -hmm. so we use a story in the band of brothers called parsifal mm -hmm. and it's about the holy grail and so for me now the holy grail is not a cup full of blood of, from christ it's a circle of men with their hearts pumping with blood, asking a young man, what ails you? What's your grief, young man? And we're willing to listen. We're willing to hear and witness your anger. We're willing to cry with you about how hard it is to be a man. And together we can sit in circle so that we can then return to our women and say, we've been off and we've done our men's work. I've cried with my brothers and I've come to terms with it and I know what I need to do and now I can show up as a healthy man for you. And she doesn't have to mother me like my mother didn't mother me when I was 11. And I can, I can then cure and heal myself because, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I found myself finding women that were older than me that could mother me falling in love with motherly women mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I just didn't get that when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And so now I can show up with my circle of men. And you know what great about men mm -hmm. is that they listen. They have presence. Mm -hmm. They have this beautiful quality of listening to your bone marrow. Mm -hmm. And this is what I've learned is what women like about men and what men can do for each other is to sit and support each other. And so, you know, when men hear, hear each other's grief, we become brothers. And, and there's a great deal of loyalty and respect and care that can be present when even an, an older man can say, yeah, yeah, brother, I know, what, I know what you went through. I too went through it. And you know what? I'm still alive and I'm still here and I'm here for you. So that really, that's kind of my story. Mm. That's, what, that's what I've been through. And I'm now grateful for that experience. Mm. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Mm. But, when, but I am willing to sit with people who have been through that uh, abandonment experience, that um, Lord of the Flies experience. Mm. That was a favorite book at boarding school. I bet. You know? Of yeah. course, everybody read that book and thought, right, I'm in Lord of the Flies. Um, mm. and, and we can do something about it. Mm. Us mm. men who are wounded, because that wound, you know, somebody said to me in a shamanic experience once, the, woo the, the heart is wounded, the heart is broken to allow the soul to shine through. Mm. That the mm -hmm. bleeding heart is a gift mm -hmm. that we can mm -hmm. all we can all open our hearts to each other. And let's face it, you know what's going on in the world. Leaders don't aren't, aren't accountable, don't have integrity, aren't answerable. You know, recently in government, that woman was thrown out of government for calling Boris a liar. You know, mm -hmm. you're not allowed to to be accountable to make someone else accountable. Mm -hmm. So if we can model that for young men, you know, I've seen young men in hoodies 24 hours during our initiation, 24 hours later, lift the hoodie off their, off their face, stand up, smile and go at last, what I've been waiting for all my life, a man I can trust. I'm going to give up the drugs, alcohol and crime. I'm going to get a normal life. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to get a good relationship. And we go, well, didn't your dad tell you that? Or your stepdad tell you that? And they go, yeah, I couldn't hear it off him. 
What I needed to hear it off was men in my community, men I see around, normal men, real men that aren't uh, polished in their grandiosity as gurus or shaman or whatever like that. And I mm. think those days are over. I think young, ordinary men like you and me who have had the gift of that wound and can now change and rewrite the story and tell our stories to younger men and give them a place where they can weep. Bless you for your tears. Mm. Yeah, thank you, brother. Mm. Yeah, it's very beautiful. Kind of as you speak, it reminds me of um, what Robert Bly says is that you know when we see the young man causing chaos you know we can't blame them yeah. you know, it's the up to the older men to step yeah. in yeah that and, african yeah. proverb if yeah. we don't welcome young men into the village they will burn it down just to feel some warmth hmm. it's yeah. a beautiful thing so do we have yeah. a village stephen jenkins says we don't have any villages yeah so what are we welcoming them in but we create a circle that mm. is a village mm. and we welcome the young men in and say the reason you got into crime is because you have a leadership potential mm. Mm. and if you channel that in that naughty energy into something constructive you're going to change the wound to i'm not good enough to i have something to offer mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Beautiful story. Thank you very much for your courage and, you know, openness to share this here. Mm. Mm, it kind of, over the last five or six years, I've been developing a model, like a boarding school mm. healing model, I call it, or the trauma healing model. Mm. And I feel most of us, we leave boarding school, we go into the first stage of disconnection, denial, dissociation. Mm. And I feel in that space, I say, it's like the wound we have, the bandages are tightly on. It's like we deny we have a wound and therefore we deny we have any goal. And I see that that's where a lot of the people who have been traumatized as children are at. No, I'm fine. Yeah. It, was, it was a good experience, but there's no felt sense. Yeah. Uh, and I talk about the second level is like the bandages are off, the wound smells, it is painful. It's like we're taking them off. It's like, and it hurts. It, God, it hurts. Uh, Judith Herman wrote in her book, Trauma and Recovery, the second stage is remembrance, mourning. We've got to grieve our tears. Yeah. And fascinating that I found over the years listening to um, that when ex-boarders sit in circle and they hear other men share about their boarding school experiences, they find that so profound because they they realize i'm not alone yeah and didn't we all think we were alone yeah yeah totally and were we ever asked why are you sad why are you angry no i was only ever and most of the young men that i that i mentor they're never asked why are you angry mm. they're told why they're angry uh, and then no one ever shares their story of vulnerability the anger management, the social services, the probation officers, they're told don't share anything vulnerable with these young men because they will be a, become your predator. Well, we sh that's the first thing I do is I share my story with a young man and he goes, oh, fuck, you understand, you get it. You've been there. Great, I can trust you with my story. A door opens and then I share a bit more and another door opens and soon he's welcomed me into his living room. Mm. and and all i have to do is listen because mm. no one really listened i mean look i have to say this my mother was a child psychologist mm. when i came back from boarding school she worried that i was psychotic because i was chewing my nails and i had facial tics well you know come on guys i've been through two years of trauma mm. did anybody thought to ask me what ails you? Yeah. What's your grief? I'd have told them. But mm. yeah, I was wearing the bandages. I, I thought, shit, 
I'm, I'm out of that now. I can ignore it. I can push it away. I can put it into a Pandora's box. Mm. My mother used to say, don't open the box. <laughs> well, I've spent my whole life opening that box, looking at getting it out. Because you know what? The gold is in the dark. It's in those dark places, in the shadow. It just needs to be illuminated. It just needs, you know, there is no shadow without a lot of light. So there's a big light there and we just need to sort of share. And by asking and by sharing our stories in these circles, um, we're just casting light. We're just getting it heard. And then, yeah, the tears come, the grief comes. And on the other side of grief, there is connection. And what did we want when we were sent away to boarding school? We wanted love and connection because we were still in the sovereign innocence of love. We still wanted unconditional love. And when it's denied, yeah, there's a great wound there. There's a great severing of that umbilical cord to our families. And yeah, that cord flails around, spewing all this energy all over the place and we tie it up and bandage it up. But I'm really interested in what you say. So when the bandages come off, the wound is smelly. Yeah, so that's What's the, the second stage. So it's the, the healing of the wound begins. And I think, you know, Robert uh, Moore talks about that in his book, The Art of Initiation, saying that sometimes we can, he talks about three stages. He says, you know, we have some, tragedy we go into initiation where we have the grief it's like the liminal state the liminal mm -hmm. space the um and then we the third stage is kind of returning with the boon which joseph campbell talks about mm -hmm. this idea of returning and he says sometimes the second stage we can get lost there if we don't have an elder so we can get lost in our grief in our mourning the, the bands has come off but we keep picking at it and it never heals. Yeah, and I, I, lost, feel... I got lost in that stage for years. Yeah, me, me too. It was my wife. And I mean, I'll, I'll show you. Is I've got this uh, this model I've been creating on the wall. Wow. Um, and I've kind of been what trying to put it into my, my, my book. So it's in the kind of in my book. The idea is in between the stages, there are threshold moments so between stage one and stage two it might be listening to your talk yeah. that might be the trans threshold that oh my god yeah for me it was reading a couple of books by old boys who went to my school and i read them i'm like oh my god they didn't enjoy it and then i started to question maybe i didn't enjoy it and then i went into stage two and the anger came up the tears came up it's like i absolutely hated school and then i realized but i got lost there for years stage three is like the wound is the wound has healed but there is a scar tissue a scar yeah. this is where the light enters yeah yeah and i loved what yeah. um simon partridge said in the last podcast this idea that when we get to stage three we have this wound but then we give of our gift like you are giving your gift yeah. to these young men yeah you know, uh, we, we kind of work out, I have a wound and that's yeah. where my gold is. Yeah. That's what my yeah. gift is to yeah. give to the society. If I'm in stage one, I deny I have a wound. Mm. I have nothing to give. Because mm. mm. underneath the scar tissue is, is the gift. Mm. Mm. And we can be terrified of, of sensitizing that scar tissue. You know, in the shamanic world, you have a drum which represents the scar tissue over the wound and we bang that drum and we go deeply into the vibrations that it creates and the wound starts to speak mm. and that wound can be amazing gift an amazing gift in a way we were shut up we were told to be quiet um we were given cold showers in the morning I mean, I, I, I know now that's very popular. Yeah, I had, kind of tough. Yeah, I had my cold but, bath this morning. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but that as a child, um, you know, we can, we can believe that our, our feelings are not welcome. Mm -hmm. 
and yes we can we can end up all feeling all in the lover archetype all wanting uh, or indulging in our story in what you call the kind of that middle stage in the victim mm -hmm. uh, in the grief um, and and not be heard but as every time we share our grief something knits together and there's some sort of um, scar tissue that that's made of golden thread mm -hmm. I like to sort of see it um, it starts to shine out and uh, and the more we we massage that with 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 the sort of ointment of of being heard and hearing others because every time I hear one of these stories I don't know about you but there's there's, there's something drops something lets go of anger and grief mm -hmm. um, and that is a relief and the tears, those, the single tear that rolled down your left eye mm. at the end of my story, that, that is the, that is the ointment. So if you look at that under a microscope, that has incredible um, structure to it. Mm. That, that, that single tear is, um, you know, that, that one drop in the Holy Grail that drops into that Holy Grail seeing that you know that drop that that tension in my in my guts and you know i, I used to i had ibs for years because mm. i was just unable to digest my own feelings mm. but by sharing it to others suddenly that part of my body becomes more and more sensitive starts to wake up mm. uh in a better state i believe um, there's always a gift in the wound mm -hmm. um, and if we can share that and I really Piers I really honor and bless you for for doing something about this for finding your soul's purpose um, and helping all of us to to listen to these stories realize we're not alone realize that there is there are men out there willing to listen mm -hmm. and you know, once the story is shared, it changes. It stops ruining our life from the shadow. Because mm -hmm. I think my my anger, my fear, my grief just ran my life for so long because I, I couldn't face it. But when I, when I started to speak it out to someone else, I start to hear it myself. So it comes mm -hmm. out of my mouth, through your ears, back out of your eyes and... And you, you, know, you become in the mirror and then I start to hear it myself and I start to think, well, hang on, you know, I said for years that I, these boys used to shove my head down toilets and flush, flush the toilet. That never happened. Mm -hmm. But it was a really dramatic story that would get both people's sympathy. Mm -hmm. So now when I tell my story, I say, and I, it was true, I was threatened with that, but it never happened. And a part of me comes back into integrity. Once I get my story real, uh, uh, and, and once I start to add the rest of the story, which is the transformation, the gift, what I'm now doing about it, mm -hmm. then the, the, the scales start to lift and I start to become more, I have more equilibrium Mm -hmm. in my emotional life and I can I can start showing up for others thank you thank you Ben a really beautiful story with such wisdom there thank you for your your courage I was going to ask questions but I've um, sure there was something there I was going to mentioned but i it's kind of gone out of my head um i guess yeah a couple of these things like one of the things is i guess is around service mm. just the power what for you is the power of service in healing this trauma well you know uh i could you know i, I i've no longer call myself a narcissist mm -hmm. but i understand the narcissistic quality of an unhealed wound mm. so i carry it around it informs everything i do 
So when I when I'm in service, it's no longer about me. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, or this traumatic childhood suddenly begins to serve what I'm doing for others and becomes useful. Whereas I was always burying it down and it was kind of rising to the surface and bleeding out all over my behavior and my neediness. Now it serves me. Mm -hmm. So by serving others, my wound starts to serve me. And that is, that's healing. You know, all medicine is poison if you take too much of it. <laughs> so, but the medicine, if I start to share that medicine out, then I get the right amount for me. And I start to, to see in others. I mean, you know, I, one thing I've noticed, you know, I made a lot of films about gurus, mm -hmm. Sai Baba, Bhagwan, you know, all these people that, you know, were, were lots of sadhus and, and what I realized, uh, even Ram Das, you know, um, what, I've, what I realize is that most people teach what they need to learn. Mm -hmm. There's that sole purpose. So no longer do I look at my teachers or the people that I'm learning off going, well, you need to learn this, mate. You're not walking the talk. Now I have compassion that, wow, Here's a man doing something that his soul needs to learn. So he's in service to others. And the return benefit is that I get to learn it myself. Mm -hmm. I get to learn that these young men who tortured me for those two years are, are just hurt kids. Mm -hmm. And it was first done to them. I did an alternatives to violence film at Grendon Prison. And the most profound things, the most violent criminals in England in that workshop said was, I have not done anything to anyone else that wasn't first done to me. Mm -hmm. now, now, if that's healed, they then, instead of being the predator of others in the set with the same language, they become the protector of others with that language. Mm -hmm. So they get to, you know, the film, The Work is oh, an amazing yeah, transformation. Well. Yeah. Um, and yet the Native American guys were thrown out of their community for insisting that their Native American song of healing was in the film. That one, one Hispanic guy was stabbed in the, in the prison because he's seen in the film hugging a black guy. You know, there's a, there's a price, mm -hmm. but if we can create these safe spaces, if we can share this, uh, our stories with the world, then uh, people become less scared of the vulnerability that comes up. The grief, the middle stage that you're talking about, mm -hmm. it's the, everyone's scared of getting stuck in that or being bogged down or being hurt again because of it. And that's why we need the older men or the older women. We need the elders to guide us out of that to hold yeah. that space to hear our stories yeah. and then yeah. then it can kind of come out so here's the thing i talked to stephen jenkinson about rites of passage and he gave me one piece of wisdom elders have one skill that no one else in the village has and this skill is holding the bitter taste of failure in their mouths without seeking a comfortable solution. Mm. So for me, when I was, when I realized I was in your middle stage and I realized that I had a lot of pain and that the, the bandages were coming off and I had a lot of wounds, I started smoking a lot of cannabis, smoking cigarettes, uh, alcohol didn't work for me, but I started to numb the, the, the pain that was coming out. And I was unable to sit with that bitter taste. Now, if I'd held, had elders around me, and eventually I sought those elders or the qualities of those elders in other men, but if I hadn't found those, I would have carried on 
uh, finding a comfortable solution. And what happens when we have a circle of conflict and we have another circle of conflict and they mix is we get a crossover of those two circles. And in the middle is conflict. And the, the energy that's created by two things in conflict. Now, if we can stand in the middle of that conflict and not seek a comfortable solution long enough for nature to show us the solution, then we become elders. So that when the villager running around going, oh my God, there's some terrible thing happening, we sit in circle and we sit with that bitter taste saying, yes, we failed again. And we hold that space. And then what happens in nature is some a magical thing happens. A, an, indeed, a spiritual thing like the aurora around um, religious figures, this, this oval of, of golden light. And we start to realize the gold, that the gold comes out of the wound, comes out of that wounded place. If only we could sit in that bitter taste and hold off long enough to feel that comfortable solution. And in, in, I've filmed in my, my life, I've filmed a lot of indigenous ceremonies. And in those, you go through 24 hours of really uncomfortable, painful stuff. And then you get the benefit. Well, in the West, we take out a credit card and we get comfort, 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 comfort. And then a month later, we get the credit card bill. We spend 10 years paying it off. So we have to, the, the, the elders of the village have been long enough sitting in that discomfort to know the benefit of that and to be able to sit there and go, okay, let's just wait. Let's just sit in silence, listen to what's going on and that solution will come across. So, and I see people like yourself spending years listening to others' stories and then holding that and then waiting for your the hollow bone of your own wisdom the bone being the the dead cells that have died off in the experience of the pain and then clearing out the tube and then waiting for that wisdom to drop into that bone through that bone and listening for the music that comes out of that flute, that bone flute. You know, I remember the shamans who in, um, in late Titicaca in Peru, who held up the femur of their ancestors that they made a flute out of and would play this incredible music through the femur of their an ancestral bones and call the eagles. Mm -hmm. That eagle, eagle, view of the world and it takes hours of playing you know it's not something easy to do um you know on the top of a mountain in peru kind of in the freezing cold um and you know we we need to learn a bit more of that and i think that that's one of the things the pandemic is teaching us mm. to just sit in solitude holding we failed didn't we mm. we are failing we're, we're all those old ways of comfort are dropping away. And if we can breathe and we can sit there and, and wait long enough, then, um, then some, some of those solutions will come along. The problem is we've got a lot of uh, public school victims boarding school victims who are not even haven't even undone the the, the bandages yet no 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 and I, I really you know see that it's key for them to start doing that and whatever way we can do to start to mm. to start helping them take the bandages off because it's so important not just for them their families but mm. the communities the world I really see it um, as I go back over throughout history it, or just the stories of the last 300 years, the main stories we see in cinema written by ex-boarders, James Bond, Eton, yeah. Ian Fleming, 
you look at most of the actors they're all ex boarding school. a lot of the authors the, the louis de bernier boarding school all of the so it's like and then the legal system all boarding school yes. the judge it's like realizing that wow this is quite a big thing we've got to That's unpick huge. and we That's have huge. to do we have to do that yeah. I'm aware of time. I know yeah, you said I've got to leave in seven minutes. So for a meeting, but what I'd love to do is, you know, maybe finish the podcast here, and then we. I'd love to do a little check out with my guests after we finish recording. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so that gives okay. us a few minutes. Okay. But mm. thank you so much, Ben, mm -hmm. for your wisdom and your courage in sharing the mm -hmm. stories, and yeah, really touching my heart. So, well, I that story wouldn't have come out if the quality of your listening hadn't been so good. So thank you. Bless you for that. Thank you, brother. Thank mm. you. So is there uh, somewhere people, a website you have? or Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are somewhere... two websites. One is uh, uh, www.abandabrothers.org.uk. My, my, my personal website is www ben cole Cine cinematography site.com and my wife's website which is well worth dipping into is um middle earth medicine.com middle earth medicine okay i'll put them into the description oh that'd be um, great yeah middle earth medicine.com uh, Great. Well, thank we you. are we are looking for older men to become mentors. Mm. So, if you are interested, please get on to the Abandoned Brothers site. Mm. Uh, sign up. Uh, you get six weeks mentoring, um, and you can go on the Rites of Passage weekend, um, and you can become a mentor, and you can start to to turn those wounds into gifts. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Please recommend. And I have quite a few friends who have been involved, who are involved in the Band of Brothers up here in Manchester way. And, yeah, no, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I've, yeah, if you're listening to this, then please do get yeah. in touch with the Band of Brothers. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. well, thank you, Ben. And um, yeah, bless you for your work. Yeah, well, thank you. Okay. Bye bye.